Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. I've wanted to talk to you for ages. Yay. Really forward to this are. conversation. Well, Yay. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> How are you doing? Where are you? What's happening? I, I'm currently in Portland, Oregon. And I cannot wait to leave for a number of reasons. I The city has really become not a nice place. And so, someone was shot on my block a few weeks ago. Oh, God. Uh, and I live in a pretty typically middle class uh it's in in the city of Portland, so I'm 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 I'll be gone for ten months this year, so I'm looking I'm looking forward to and I'm looking forward to I'm, I'll be living in Puerto Rico next month or this actually is it January this month, and so I'm looking forward to basking in the heat over there, doing some more videos, doing some lectures and stuff. It's gonna be fun. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm fully done with winter. I'm not doing weather anymore. So what are you doing in Mexico? I've been dying to ask you that. Well, I mean, I'm just I'm living. The same that I was in Vancouver, except much better and warmer, I suppose. I like I left um, Vancouver during the the lockdowns because I just oh, couldn't wow. take it anymore, and I got I was yeah. getting real freaked out by what the government was doing, and I thought they were going to trap me there, which I they were clearly trying to do. <laughs> but I also like, you know the the politics of Vancouver, the culture of Vancouver which are pretty similar. I've never lived in Portland, but you know, pretty similar to those. It's probably, those, you know, probably quite similar, right? The mayor Seattle, has pronouns Portland. in his bio and the yeah. this, you know, district attorney. Yeah. So, and, and there's a, there's an epidemic of social justice with homeless people everywhere and drugs and yeah. de defunding the police and the murder rate has skyrocketed and all, all the, uh, the usual things that accompany social justice. In fact, the the point of social justice. So are you, what are you doing for, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, what are you like doing for work or like, what's your day look like in Mexico? And where it's, in Mexico are you? I'm in Sayulita, which is about an hour away from Puerto Vallarta. So it's this small, pretty weird little beach town that became, it was a fishing village at one point that people discovered as like a surf destination. Right, right. So it started to become populated with gringos on account of the surfing. Um, I mean, a lot of the Mexicans surf here too, obviously. Um, and it's gotten more popular, I'd say probably in the last, I've, I'd been coming here on vacation for like six years or something before I just never went back home again. So it's been coming, becoming busier with tourists so it's quite a like it's a huh. small town but it can get quite busy huh. but it's also like yeah it's a small community which i really like like i don't think i want to live in a city ever again i grew, i spent 40 years in vancouver and mm. i'm sort of over it like i like living in a place where i can walk everywhere where i know sure. people you walk out the door you know the guy across the street at the taco stand like you know what i mean like i like that lifestyle a bit more and work, I mean, I'm doing the, the same thing I was doing in Vancouver. I mean, I'm I'm just doing two podcasts. Um, I'm trying to focus more on my sub stack now on writing. I'm always wanting to write more and not having enough time to write. YouTube yeah. channel. Um, I'm, re I'm just doing, I'm working mostly for my self which keeps me quite busy yeah i'm sure i'm sure it does and you feel safe down there you feel things are yeah i mean where i am it is pretty safe i mean you do still have to be careful like you mm. can't you, you do have to be careful it's mexico and things are a oh. bit lawless but that's also what i like about mexico <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 it's probably <laughs> yeah, like it's probably safer than portland like i mean from what i've heard about vancouver and portland and san francisco i mean it seems pretty scary i mean in vancouver i think it's it's quite a bit worse in portland seattle san francisco but it, as you, as we mentioned earlier like it's the same kind of thing is happening in vancouver which is that the homelessness problem and like the tent cities have sprawled out far 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 beyond where it was contained in the past and so there's like stranger violence all the time and it's extended into all these other middle class neighborhoods. Um, the addiction problem is way out of hand and the way that they're dealing with it is by giving out more drugs and not providing any sort of treatment or like mental health. There's no, there's no real mental health facilities here. There hasn't been for several decades now when they shut down like our biggest mental health facility, Fraser View, I think it was called. Um, and, and like, and as far as I understand it, it's not every, my mind has changed about all of these things in the past, I don't know, three to five years. 
but it's not actually the homeless homelessness pro problem is not about lack of homes. It's about people not wanting to be in the spaces offered or provided to them, which I'm sure are not very nice or glamorous spaces, but you know, it, it's not a problem that can be resolved by creating more homes or rooms for these people to be in because they want to be outside for the, the lifestyle, I suppose you could call it. Yeah. And uh, my buddy Schellenberger in San Francisco writes one of the most important evidence-based. It's amazing that, that, that this can consistently gets ignored, ignored, trampled upon by ideology is uh, shelter first housing earned. And so we don't just dole out housing to people where they can continue to do drugs, but they need a recovery plan. Everyone yeah. has a kind of deserved shelter, but we, we have a, a central city concern. We have places here in Portland that deal with it. I, I think there has to be a national, we need a kind of Manhattan project to deal with this, which, which is basically I interesting. It has to be in a national level. It's two things. One, it's just so, that's the other thing is I just feel so befuddled because certain things are so obvious. No tent camping. Like mm -hmm. no tent camping. And and we can we can talk about the data and the evidence for that. But one of the things that I've seen, it's like the frog in the in the pot of water. I consistently see the deterioration of the society, primarily fueled by social justice. It's it's in fact almost exclusively fueled by social justice. It's compounded by other factors on the right, of course. But yeah, so that's that's the, okay. So one one more thing. So I think we need a federal a solution to this because I don't think I think it was Shermer was telling me when they improved or gave more money in San Francisco to um, housing, drug and alcohol treatment, et cetera. I think they they almost doubled the budget if if I remember correctly. But don't 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 quote me on that. Just look at the data. And more than twice the number of people came seeking services. So there has to be some kind of a national referendum or massive project for this. And I, I don't think that there is because I think at core, it's too ideological. It's hyper politicized. I don't think uh, certainly Biden is utterly incapable of it. I don't, I don't really think anybody would tackle that beast. But, you know, I, I put out a tweet. I, I think the right has become the right has completely lost its way. I'm never really sure they've ultimately had their way on some on an issue by issue basis. But something like you know, I I, I attack the right's preoccupation with groomers and drag shows, and I put out a poll. What what what? Uh, I can't remember the, the exact wording of the poll, but in terms of U.S. problems, children at drag shows ranks it's like one to three four to 20 21 to 200 and not in the top 200 and of course this is skewed because it's people who go to my stuff because i fight the the fringe left and who's taken no, not fringe anymore the woke yeah the the woke which so many people find themselves in that the orbit of the ideology or have sympathies to that now um but i just think it's a failure to morally and politically triage i i just just off the top of my head the deficit, the debt and the deficit, ideological capture of colleges and universities and teachers training programs is even worse. Um, homelessness, drug addiction, uh, health of the oceans. I mean, these things, it, it just in, in it murder rates just in the sheer scope. It's astonishing to me that people would think that drag shows, children of drag shows would be in the top 5,000 problems that we face, certainly within the top 500 of the problems we face. Yeah. I mean, I think that the children at drag shows thing is weird and bad, and I don't understand why parents would take their kids to this thing, but I certainly am not obsessed, and I don't totally understand the obsession. I mean, I think that addiction and the overdose crisis is probably a much bigger issue and much more important. And like you say, I mean, our cities are just getting less and less safe. I've spent quite a bit of time in San Francisco um, this past year or so uh, because my partner lives there part-time. And the amount of like crazy people 
all over the street and tents everywhere. Like it's not an exaggeration when people talk no, about this. I know. And it's scary for I mean it's it's strange because the social justice people uh you know they claim to be sticking up for the marginalized but and i've said this for a long time but they don't seem to give a shit about women like all the defund police even when i was real deep into like the left and radical feminism i was always opposed to the defund the police mantra prospect um the that that political mantra because it's horrible for women Right. I it's mean, what, we're the ones the, who are vulnerable. Who do right. we call when our boyfriend beats us up? Or, you know, like if I'm walking down the street and there's a crazy man, I'm scared. And I've been attacked by those people. You know, like I've been screamed at, followed, threatened, spat so you, on. You, you, you mean the social worker won't work when there's some raging maniac w with a machete or a rapist or a group of, of young males? No, I mean, that defund the police movement was just truly i was thinking about that this morning i think it's one of the most unhinged and deranged ideas i've heard in a long time but the thinking for that is that the police are the line between uh the capitalist patriarchy they, they they're the ones who enforce the system or systems of oppression but back back to the drag show things real real quick mm -hmm. so just just as the I've asked people repeatedly, so what evidence do you have beside a moral intuition or a gut response? And I just want to be crystal clear about something. I'm not saying I want kids to go to drag, to drag shows. I'm just, <laughs> I'm not saying that. I, I'm just asking for people who are so vociferous in this. What evidence do you have for this? And I've yet to hear any evidence. I'd love to see. And in fact, I don't even think there could be any evidence because I don't think that the problem has been studied. But this is a dog whistle. This is something to kind of rally the base. This is something to get clicks or to get people excited about. Whereas the substantive problems we have, you know, cutting back on our spending, talking meaningful about energy independence, or at least getting off of foreign oil, the sub the substantive problems which we face, loose nukes, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. I mean, again, the list goes on. These are complicated things, and it's very difficult without having immersed yourself in the literature to to understand the nuances and the subtleties of these positions. But you can just point at ch children or drag shows bad, for which, as far as I know, there's no evidence for. There may be arguments for, maybe they're good or they're bad, but the right and the left both do it with different different content. I think you're probably right about the evidence thing. I think the concern is, and I have concerns about this too, is around the the ideology that's being taught to children through these drag queen story hours because they often will read books. Like I've gone through the reading lists of some of these projects and they're teaching gender identity ideology. Um, you know, like sometimes a girl can be born a boy and everybody thinks that it's a boy and then they realize it's a girl. I can't remember what this, okay. I've written about this a few times. So I think that's probably a concern. Okay. So let, let let me let me ask you a question. And this is, you know, we haven't talked about what we're going to talk about. So so I don't expect you to have the answer to this, and I don't have the answer to this either. How many children do you think go to drag shows? <laughs> I mean, what 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 number of, of of kids are we actually talking about here? Are we talking? About, I mean, probably that ma not that many, because this would be exclusively right. happening or almost exclusively happening in urban centers. Like, I don't think this is a popular thing that's happening in rural areas, and there is so many okay. towns and cities across North America that right. would so not is it, be seeing these kinds of things. I mean, I'm just throwing this out. Is it like a thousand <laughs> kids a year? I mean, I, I don't know what it is, but the same books that, that you mentioned, and I'm not familiar with what those books are. I can almost assure you that they're being taught as some form of liberatory education or to develop a, what Powell Ferrer says, a critical consciousness or theory those books are being taught in mass in colleges of education to t in teacher training programs. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it is orders of magnitude, literally orders of magnitude, but there's an obsessive preoccupation with children at drag shows. And I just don't, I, it's just sloppy thinking. It's poor. It's not evidence-based. And uh, I, I frankly grow tired of it. And the other thing is it's not a positive vision for the country. So many, and Chris Rufo just tweeted me today, and Dave Rubin invited me on his show. He saw the tweet. I'm going to go on again. Full disclosure, Dave is a very good friend of mine. But um, 
I, I do think we lose something when we become when we just respond to what our ideological enemies, the madness that they're that they're spewing, that the, the response to somebody else's crazy is not you becoming crazy, right? The, the, sure, the it shouldn't just be reactionary. Right. And and it also shouldn't be because someone doesn't have evidence for some deranged belief that they have. It doesn't mean you spew another deranged belief on the other side for which you have no evidence. The solution is always the same. Like, what's the evidence? You take a dispassionate look at it. And then from there, you can formulate public policies, but only after you have a kind of consensus on what what the evidence should be. Mm -hmm. So it's just so fr it's just very frustrating to me. I, t I, I, I see what you're saying for sure. And I think that you are correct in many ways. I mean, I do, I have a lot of concerns around sexualization and things like the normalization of like strip clubs, pole dancing, pornography, which is coming at kids from all sorts of different directions. I mean, the primary concern there, I would think would be exposure to porn because kids are exposed to porn really, really young. And a lot of kids are. I mean, you can you can't really go on the internet anymore without being exposed to pornography. But I will say, I did. I shared a tweet that I think was from Melissa Chen, which was, you know, there were little kids at this drag show, and the drag queen was looked like and was behaving like a stripper, and it was very sexual. And to me, I think that if parents bringing their kids to that again is really strange. Like, I don't think that's something kids should be exposed to. I don't think that's a super common thing, but it's clearly happening here and there. And people react very strongly to that kind of imagery. Right. Okay. So we got multiple things going on. We have the pornography, which is a huge talk, and we can talk about waves of feminism, Catherine McKinnon and, and uh, Helen Joyce and others who have just spoken about that. And I just listened to a great podcast that Sh Shermer ha had, uh, did about that and then we have the children of drag shows and the sexualizing children uh we could talk about something to totally different uh, <laughs> but it does seem it does seem that they're intertwined so, so i guess that's the other thing what evidence is there that children exposed to sex and i realize that's not a precise statement or sexuality uh, I mean, I'm thinking of countries in which uh, seven or eight people live in a small room and the and the husbands and wives um, or yeah, cu like couples that. have sex with each other. Yeah. So, so I don't mean to be postmodernist. But it, you, I mean, but it's but not. I'm not a, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. But I mean, I think for me, I'm not talking about just sex. I'm sort of talking about. I mean, I think that pornography is bad for adults, too. Right. Not just for kids. I think that one of the things that people talk about in terms of exposing kids to uh, like hypersexualized imagery and media and stuff like that is that one of the things that like child abusers will do to kind of groom the kid towards molestation is to show them pornography, to sort of normalize that kind of imagery and then lead them into the molestation situation that way uh, okay so i just uh, uh, let's take a, a step adjacent to that isn't one of the primary conservative values states rights parental rights uh how kind of individual autonomy over tyranny uh self-governance etc and that would seem to me, and again, I'm not advocating to be crystal clear that I don't, I don't, I personally don't think children should be going to drag shows, but that's an, another story entirely. That, 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 that'd be another argument. But how does one who's a conservative reconcile parental rights with one's desire to take uh, their child to a drag show? Seems to me to be an inconsistency there. Yeah, probably. I don't, I mean, you know, I'm not that familiar with conservatism. I'm sort of learning more about conservatives and the right only recently because it was not part of my bubble. Like I, right. I really was, I was like the people that I'm critical of now in many ways, which is to say that I grew up in a very progressive urban center around other people who were progressives and 
while I thought that conservatives and the right were bad, I didn't even bother engaging with what they were saying and thinking and pushing beyond, you know, private property is bad and privatized healthcare is bad and we need social safety nets and we need a welfare system. Landlords are bad. Capitalism is bad. Like all these blanket yeah, ideas. That's the, that's, the, that's the old love. That's the left. The, the new left has bartered economics for identity politics, <laughs> right? So, 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 so the new left looks at things in terms of um, sexuality, race, gender, et cetera, whereas the old left looked at inequalities, class. yeah, cl class systems and how to flatten the, the pyramid, progressive tax systems, et cetera. You saw that. Well, I was going to make some American references, but you're Canadian, and I know I know very little about Canadian politics. Um, I mean, I, yeah. I I know enough about American politics. I think I actually have dual citizenship. I've just never oh. lived in America before. Oh wow! My mother is American. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's pretty handy if you don't want to go back to Canada. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I remember, I remember when Trump got in. Uh, um, applications for citizenship skyrocketed. I think it even crashed the site if memory serves me correctly. <laughs> New Zealand, Australia, et cetera. Um, no, but I think that un underlying underlying all these things, whether you're on the right or the left, is that people have these strong moral impulses. And I do think that, that like Steven Pinker, I do think that that impulse, and Socrates, that, that impulse is toward the good. But I think that people become lost in their own moral impulses i think that they are those those the desire to do good and to to be good and to what it means for someone to be a good person becomes lost the search for evidence becomes lost for that and that mm -hmm. has to always be a north star you know what is the evidence why do we believe this is it this cultural is do i have good re like it doesn't matter if it's on the left like defunding the police or if it's on the right like abortion restrictions it really doesn't matter what it is it's always the 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 mantra should always be what's the evidence for that and what would it take for me to change my mind about that yeah it's interesting because recently i've been thinking a lot about the i mean there's this massive backlash to woke as we call it um and feminism is encapsulated in that, you know, like there's a backlash to feminism also, which I notice and I've seen in terms of there being, and I don't, I mean, I think it's new, but I, I didn't follow this arena very closely before. So it's hard to say for sure of women who are kind of like, I guess, trying to be like the female version of an edgelord, you know, like the red pilled woman who is going after the toxic female um, sort of villainizing women. Like if your girlfriend acts like this, like get the fuck away from her. Yeah, she's honey an evil badgers. demon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's manipulating you. Don't let her tell you what to do. And beyond that, where it's, you know, you shouldn't sleep around. It's best to get married and have kids young. That's the best thing for women. I'm not saying that women shouldn't do that if they want to. It's a good idea to think about trying to have kids young, but I don't think it's necessarily the best thing for all women to get married and have kids. I don't think that marriage is like a blanket good thing necessarily. I also don't think it's an inherently bad thing. Um, and, you know, I saw this tweet from this right wing woman. I don't follow her, so I don't know how it showed up in my feed saying something like your husband should rarely, if ever, say no. You know, essentially, it's your job as a wife to meet his needs. He shouldn't be being rejected for sex all the time. And I was like, OK, like, no, nobody should be being rejected for sex all the time. But say your husband wants to have sex every day, he's going to be hearing no a lot. And it shouldn't be like telling him, uh, telling men, like I thought it was a bad message for men, not so much for women, because now men are going to go back to their relationship and be like, you shouldn't be saying no to me, which is a kind of gross message. <laughs> yeah, that's creepy, a little creepy, too. I, I think um, if, if memory, this is outside my area of expertise, but I, I read a paper once that said t 10 let's see what the was the claim and again i just want to say this is outside my area i don't really 
talk I, I i've become uncomfortable with talking about things that i haven't published Sorry. about <laughs> no 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 no. I'm happy <laughs> i to went talk off about on it. a bit of a tangent no 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 <laughs> i'm happy to talk about it but just so everybody knows i've not published in this and so i'm a little hesitant to talk about it, but 10 percent of men but only 10 percent of women want sex as much as the average man right and so uh steve stewart williams has put some stuff out about this um, Jordan Peterson has discussed this uh, on the popular stage. So it, 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 you have a radically disproportionate, it, it, it's not, and if you look at the, the top two reasons for divorce, number one is money and number two is sex. But if you break that down more, it's, they're just incommensurable appetites. Men just want to have sex more. Women want to have sex less. And so how does that, the key to those relationships then would be, to figure that out and there are evolutionary reasons for that and that that is a general rule tends to be why men uh, are less forgiving of um, adulterous affairs uh, so I, I don't i don't know i i actually don't even know where the conversation is leading but i i do i do think that that it's important to acknowledge that there are um sexual disparities the disparities yeah. in terms of sexual appetites yeah, I, you're right. I mean, I think that it's very normal, you know, in my personal experiences and based to on talking to other women, but also what I've read in terms of data, it's very normal, especially in long-term relationships for women to lose interest in sex, but for men yes. to still want the sex and then 100%. there's a conflict. That is exactly what my my understanding of the data is. And so how one navigates that, I mean, I don't want to be overly personal. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess the, the key would be if one wanted to maintain a long-term relationship. And frankly, I've been even wondering and thinking about that myself. That's a holdover from Christianity. It's a holdover from when people died at 30. Uh, it, it's just been something that I've been re-examining myself. Just you know, thinking about what that would mean. I, I'm not sure it would be too good for society, but the divorce rates are over 50% and... It's hard to get accurate data on that because a lot of that comes from polling and people will lie about two things. They'll lie about sex and they'll lie about food. So it's, hard, <laughs> it's, it's you know, like that's why all those studies about diet, they're hard to get accurate assessments because people say, did you have chocolate cake? No. Uh, <laughs> how come you gained eight pounds this week? Man, it's a fucking mystery to me. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> which reminds me, I've, I've watched every episode of uh, my 600 pound life. It's my, my guilty pleasure. I, oh, really? I, oh, I, love I that find show. it too <laughs> gross to be oh, honest. I, love it. I can't I, watch it. I, it I watch it and I, I answer email while I watch it. I just, I just like, it's my guilty pleasure. I what do you like I about it. it? Oh, it, oh my God. I don't even know where to begin with that. In fact, my, <laughs> my, my son for Christmas, um, not this Christmas, last Christmas gave me a, a framed picture of Dr. Nazarden. And then, um, I have a, I, ha I had a small Airbnb and I kept the picture in and someone said to me, who is that man? Who's that doctor in the picture? And I said, that's one of my heroes. That's, that's Dr. Nazarden. And this woman said, well, who's that? And I said, well, he pioneered bariatric surgery for the super morbidly obese. And she looked at me like I was completely <laughs> insane, <laughs> but it's, it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable show because it's one of the most hopeful things that I've ever seen. Right. So here are these people who are like a lot of these people can barely move. They're just miserable. They're trapped in their bodies. They have, you know, we, we talk about addiction. We don't food addiction. Isn't the first thing that comes to our mind. It's usually substance abuse. Um, and so these people go on this remarkable journey, but if you notice, even in those journeys, they have to help themselves. I'm thinking shelter first housing earned. They have to help themselves before Dr. Nazarden will, will give them um, um, bariatric surgery. And, and I just find those, those individual journeys of people who are just so down and out. Uh, I just find them truly inspiring. That makes sense. I've, I've never even watched through an entire episode, so I wouldn't oh, have wow. known. Like I've just seen clips and been like, oh, I don't want to watch this and seen clips of like what the people are eating throughout the day. And I don't like watching that because it, it's i find it yeah i find it well impossible. yeah so he'll he puts him on a scale and said well how how, how the skin you know, on the scale doesn't lie what happened and the people, i don't know i don't know and people will just you know they'll they'll it's fine it says the easiest person to deceive is yourself the easiest person to yeah. fool is yourself so you know we have self-deception going on there as as well but it, it's also 
a really good example of, I think one of the things we've lost is the value of hard work, effort, determination. So, so the right and the left have failed on this. The, 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 the right is absolutely correct that those are the values that we need to put forward, but people need a level playing field. They need a possibility of achieving those values. And this, that we do have systems right now that make, make it far more difficult for lower income people to succeed. Um, and those lower income people um, in general, pe people think it's a, it's a racial thing. I, 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 I don't, I don't, think there's evidence for that but i could be wrong i think it's primarily a class thing and mm -hmm. blacks have have less accrued wealth than than whites and um, i think it's about class too yeah so so i i, I think that in order for to, to the promulgating those values would be far more um that's what i'm looking for um those are reasonable values that we should put forward as a country and help people strive for, but we have to give them the resources and the opportunity to do so. And the, the, and the left has gone crazy. And, and there's a reason they've gone crazy is because people in living in, in, in school districts in which they don't even have a toilet paper. I'm thinking of some zip codes in Detroit. Um, hmm. um, the, the, so they haven't had equality. And so now they're screaming about equity. Well, and, but and, that's interesting because in places like Canada, that's not a thing that exists. Our public schools are all pretty good. Yeah. Right. Like the kind of the kind of like I'll take your word for it. There's certainly yeah. poverty that exists in Canada, and there's a major problem on reserves. Like there's reserves that don't have clean water, um, and then there's a huge, huge addiction problem. Like you know, they're they're living as though they're in a third world country. There's sure. tons of sexual abuse and otherwise. Um, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt and I want to no, let you finish what you're saying, no. but I think that like, it's like for Canada, which is a very, very progressive woke country, again, especially in the urban centers, it doesn't, it's not a reaction to that. Like it's, it's not people who are seeing real poverty every day who are entrenched in woke yeah. politics in Canada. It's people right. who are in real middle or upper class bubbles who are entrenched in that kind of politics. Right. So, so then in those, if, if you have some way to determine that those systems are fair, uh, you know, budgetary allocations or whatever the, the way to determine is, then the question would be, how does one explain system? How does one display, explain disparities among groups? How does one explain dis disparities among individuals? I mean, if there is a disparity uh, that, you know, this is the, the, the Amy Chu writes about this, the being a tiger mom. And, and we, when we look at data, nobody wants to talk about Asian Americans and the data for Asian American success and how there is systemic race, racism and it's against Asians, particularly in, in Ivy League schools. Harvard, I think they're depending on how one defines Asians, about 1.8% of the population and about 20% of the graduating class in math and sciences and Ivy League colleges. But the question is, so if the systems are fair and the outcomes are disparate, how does one explain that? Mm -hmm. And so one thing Kendi and others never want to touch is that there could be cultural reasons for this. And the other thing that literally nobody except race realists want to touch is that there, there could be a kind of social Darwinism uh, operating there. But again, that's, that's the third rail. Nobody will, will talk about that. So, but, but even bracketing that for a second, and again, this is w way beyond my area. You still, the, the idea that, that different parenting styles could yield, could yield identical results consistently and over time strikes me as just false. I mean, it just st strikes me as that, that's, that's, that's a, that's a, just an astonishing claim. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we know, I just, I just um, read my, my buddy's manuscript. I just reread my buddy's manuscript, the gift of violence. He'd be a great guy for your show. Um, Who is it? Matt Thornton, the gift of violence. Okay. He's Conor McGregor's coach's coach. I don't know if you know who Conor oh, cool. McGregor is, but yeah. Definitely. So, you know, if there's no adult male in the home, we, we know that, um, um, it, that's one of the factors, a, a criminogenic factor. So we, you know, we know it's age, we know it's sex and we know it's no adult male in the home. We also know that I, if memory serves me correctly, I, I wrote about this in my dissertation. I, and then I read it again in 2006. If you, if one parent is incarcerated, the, the likelihood that a child will be incarcerated is, uh, it's one in seven. And that number grows up dramatically if two parents are incarcerated. So 
just in that variable alone, looking at nothing else, it just seems to me to be absurd to say that culture and upbringing and parenting have nothing to do with it. I mean, it just seems ludicrous. Of course. I want to, I'm, I, I want to quickly go back to the fat thing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Any, anything I you forget. want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that, I'm curious to know what you think about this, let's call it, I keep repeating the word woke, which I we talked yeah, about yeah. this before we started recording. Like, I'm tired of saying that word. I just don't know what else to, to it's say. The best, it's the best word there is. Some people know what you mean when you say it. So yeah. there you go. But this sort of woke embrace of fat, which there's been a big backlash against from the heterodox arena and from the right. And I think that's gone a bit over the top because I think that it's probably – good to make clothes for diverse bodies and you know even for me as a woman who is not fat it's difficult to find clothes that fit but you know do you think that's do you think it's a bad thing that we're seeing all these like fatter bodies in media in advertising um online and a lot of you know efforts to try to kind of sexualize and normalize fat bodies that's a, a fantastic question. I think it's important to, to look at that, to kind of delve into that in a more granular way. The the One of the, the main people who's responsible for this is this woman, Charlotte Cooper, out of the UK. She runs the journal Fat Studies, which we put a hoax paper in Fat, fat Studies saying there should be a pr class of professional bodybuilding in which fat people are allowed to, to go in and display their roles of fat in fashion, like fashion in non-competitive ways in professional bodybuilding. Um, and then, and then it was quite popular in the, in the two thousands uh, up until, I don't know, about eight years ago, which fat, some universities still have fat studies. So the fat studies journal and fat studies period, th these are not talking about things, you know, a one C's or, uh, you know, um, carbohydrate to, protein ratios or what have you, ideal body weights. It's, it's a way to normalize fat. It's, it's a way to push an agenda, uh, again, using the, the typical tools they do, critical consciousness, phobias. If you don't like something, you're phobic as opposed to the thing, the, you know, you don't sleep with this person who has different set of genitals, you're a transphobe, et cetera. So, okay, so that's kind of, that's a, a, a very crude and gross overview of, so, so the idea then is that we went from um, modernist, normalized standards of beauty to postmodern standards of beauty, whereas like, anybody can be, Jordan Peterson put out a tweet about, you know, this is not beautiful with mm -hmm. a large, large woman and everybody went, went crazy. Um, so, uh, so back to the question. So that, that's the context for answering the question. So obviously different people should be represented and different people should be cast, uh, but that's, or maybe it's not obvious, but I, I have no problem with it. But the problem is is um, making claims about reality that are simply not true. Like uh, has you can be healthy at every size, right? Um, and and making claims saying that the, even they've switched the word from fat from obesity to fat, so they believe everything is a narrative, and a narrative is basically a story you tell yourself, and so obesity is a narrative for them. It's a but it's a n medicalized narrative, and they want to get out of medicalized narratives. When I say they, like Charlotte Cooper, Fat Studies, um, um, people operating in this domain of thought, and so they want to they want to normalize being fat. Um, and I can tell you being fat, I don't probably don't have to tell you this, although you look quite thin, but being fat is no fun. Um, and, and I'm not talking for social reasons. It's not only as a drag on your health. And it, I did a, we, Matt Thornton, the guy whose book I mentioned to you, the gift of violence, we did a show crit uh, critiquing NPR and one of their segments on, on fat fatness. And they had a, someone, um, who was clearly seeped in the language, in the culture, in the way of thinking about, you know, she kept saying large bodies moving through the world. So if if you're just talking about representing an array of people, I have no problem with that. My problem is that when you make claims about reality that are demonstrably false, and in particular, nobody wants to hear this, but it's true, young women are more susceptible to that. Mm -hmm. And so 
so we we need to be careful about whether something is just my opinion or it's a social trend or whether it's pl- putting facts and information out there that are harmful to to people in general and, and young women in particular. Well, and you know what goes along with this pro fat movement, which you know is directed primarily at women and young women is this, you know, it's not, I've seen this many times on like Instagram and stuff like that. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong. If you want a cupcake, you should just eat a cupcake. Like if you, there's nothing inherently wrong with chips or pop. Like it's, if your body wants it, then you should be able to have it. And then of course, along with that goes the, there's nothing wrong with being fat and having a fat body and you can be healthy and fat. And first of all, yeah, I think it would just basically be really uncomfortable to be fat your clothes would feel uncomfortable sitting in a chair would be uncomfortable walking around would be uncomfortable moving about in the world would be uncomfortable being being in the heat right being in the heat would be uncomfortable and then of course it's not okay to just eat a cupcake whenever you want to eat a cupcake and you shouldn't drink pop and eat chips i mean sure every once in a while but pop is really really bad for you yeah, it's sh- sh- sugar. Uh, okay, so 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 we should probably break that down. So when the norms of society fell apart in the postmodern age, when so so before people were critical to keep others in line, but but a really good argument could be made that they were critical of the wrong things. So you know, they would glower at some two gays walking down the street if they were holding hands or, or something of that, something like that. And, and people used the fact that we, that we, and I say we, I mean, in the Americas, we castigated and chastised people who, like I'm thinking of the, the movie Easy Rider, who didn't fit whatever was normative in the society at that time. And so they've used that to say that we need to suspend or withhold all judgments about things. And in fact, what we should be doing is exactly the opposite. We should be teaching people how to make better, more discerning judgments, particularly as it runs into the moral sphere about things. The the idea that, that all types of lives are equal and that you can be 500 pounds or like my 600 pound life um, is that you can, live like that. And I, I, the only exception I can think of to that is a sumo wrestler. Like I, I really can't think of any other exception in which someone intentionally intends to become 500 pounds overweight. And then, or that it would be helpful or beneficial in any way at all. Yeah. Again, unless, unless one is a su- sumo, sumo wrestler, wrestler or unless there's some bizarre circumstance, which I can't even think of right now, but we're promulgating this stuff in society and we're normalizing things that are simply not normal. I mean, the, 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 and, and again, this is not a critique of individuals who are fat, which I'm sure that, that you know, so that's the other thing I'll just, uh, block this out. I've come to the conclusion that literally no matter what, I say, or anybody says people will clip it out or, you know, they'll, they'll intentionally misconstrue what one is saying. And so at some point you just have to say like, listen, these people have literally nothing to offer. If you want to give me a substantive criticism or offer some argument or evidence or what have you, I'll I'll take a listen. Now I'm even beyond that. I'm not even sure I'll do that anymore because there's just so much noise. It's become impossible to, to, or you engage someone and the next thing you know, they're screaming at you that, that you're a Nazi out of nowhere. Um, but but I think that the I think that the argument holds is that when the normative structures are, of society fell, the response to that was this postmodern idea that kind of anything goes, any type of life we can lead. You know, we don't really know anything. Boys could be girls. The gender is just assigned at birth. Like, who are we to say? Uh, you know, if someone has a penis, they're more likely to be homosexual, heterosexual. Like we have no idea. It's just what it's, it's systems of oppression we've been born into, but that ne- neglects some features of reality. And that's why part and pa- part and parcel of this within this ideological suite of propositions has to be biology den- denialism. You have to deny biology because only then can you make the things 
the deranged ideas that you believe work. But again, remember, this is very common on the right too. The, the left, this is not in the province of the left. The, the problem is that the left happens to control the engines of knowledge production right now. They, they happen to control most legacy media. They happen to control, um, you know, universities. And so they can kind of, to, to, to parrot off of Noam Chomsky, they can kind of manufacture what they consider to be knowledge about the world, but it's simply not knowledge about the world. It's musings of ideologues, ideologues who unfortunately happen to have jobs for life. Right. I and don't know I, if that was, that was too discombobulated, but that's. The... Well, I mean, it makes sense to me in terms of, you know, m most of my career in feminism, like I started writing about and doing feminist radio, like over 10 years ago. And most of it was a critique of third wave feminism, which latched on to that anything goes idea. Any choice that you make is a feminist choice. Any choice, anything you do as a woman, if you're choosing it, that's inherently empowering. So if you're fat, that's empowering. If you want to be a prostitute, that's empowering. If you want to be in porn, that's empowering. And it's all taken out of context and nobody wants to talk about the consequences of any of that. It's just, you made a choice, you want to sell sex, that's the end of the conversation. Nobody wants to talk about like how that impacts you psychologically, right. emotionally, physically. It's obviously dangerous in a variety of ways. And, you know, third wave feminism is very much a part of that postmodern trend. Um, and... It's, I mean, fat, I think the idea of fat phobia and the fat positive movement came out of that. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's why it's really important to understand the role that intersectionality played in the third wave feminism. In fact, I was just talking to, to, to my son about a, a fifth, fifth wave of feminism, which we could talk about if you want. But um, I, th that, the other problem is that that term has become so uh, loaded and it's become so polarized and it's a long way from first wave suffrage. It's a, it's a long way from second yeah. wave. And now it's become um, muddied with, uh, and then, then, then you also have the, um, you know, turf battle. I just looking at this thing about men who consistently win, win women's beauty pageants or win again, <laughs> it's just so funny to me. It's like, it's just so bizarre. It's like, the, the best women are men, you know, <laughs> it's just, totally it's, it's, woman it's of just, the year. Right. It's it, a man. It's just, it's so, it's just it's so, like the, uh, the highest paid CEO is a man or female CEO is a man. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's, it's just amazing. It's like, it's, it's so conspicuously, um, the erasure of women, you know, it, it's so, and it tainted with some misogyny. Um, you know, Andrew Sullivan has written some great stuff about, um, it, maybe erasure is too strong, but, you know, all, all the horrific things they do to young boys who are almost definitely gay. Uh, Andrew Doyle, my friend in, in, in the UK from GB News, his new book is about uh, the New Puritans is absolutely fantastic, too. Um, he's written and, and spoken about that very eloquently and not, not to pull the identity card, but he's spoken about it in a way that I can't because he's he's a gay male. Um, and and the the um, abuses, it's you know, it's kind of like what they the they the British did to Alan Turing, chemical castration, all those horrific things, th th these, these truly horrific things. We see those repeated now in, in a, um, what's just so obvious to me is a homophobic movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it practically erases the possibility for being gay because now if you're a lesbian, you should also be able to be attracted to and consider males as potential mates and vice versa. And they are, you know, they do that to straight men too. Like we want to pretend like trans women are just the same as women and therefore heterosexual men should be equally as attracted to these men as they should be to women. And it's completely ignoring, of course, the basic realities of biology but also the the realities of biology that are not so obvious like that we can't see with our eyes like things like smell you know what i mean yeah i absolutely 100% so what's amazing to me is i'm i'm constantly amazed at how fucking stupid this is like i'm 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 truly 
flabbergasted at how people are taken in by things that are clearly false, like just demonstrably couldn't be more demonstrably false. And, and I, I wonder, I've, I've often thought that, that this society has been overtaken by multiple simultaneous mass delusions. Um, and anybody who tries to point this out, and unfortunately being one of the first people <laughs> is the ones that people who get the most shit, uh, you know, pointing this out for years now. Th the good news is that now when you point it out, um, things that you couldn't have even said two years ago seem obvious today. You know, BLM is a total scam. The the leaders bought big mansions and they absconded with all the money. And I mean, it, the, so much of this stuff is just the most idiotic uh, so, so I think if anything, we, maybe we need to be more charitable to other people throughout history and saying, cause like sometimes, you know, we look back and like, well, how did the people fall for that? You know, Maoist struggles, like how did people fall? Well, now we know, we know exactly how they fall. And I do think that there is, um, I do think that the way to think about this rather than left, right, conservative, liberal, or even first, second, or third wave, or fourth, or even fifth wave, is I think that the the axis that's emerging from this is authoritarian or not authoritarian. Mm. We have many people on the right and the left who are just authoritarians, and whether it's with COVID, that's another story, but they just want to deny other people the right to think and feel and love and be in the world and the type and create the types of communities that they want to create. And and they think that they know best and they want you to have certain opinions, you know, right or wrong. The woman who was praying outside the abortion clinic and to be cr crystal clear, I'm pro-choice. I think people should be allowed to pray anywhere they want to pray. If you want to talk to yourself, there's, there's no, nobody. It, it's insane to me to think that you'd be arrested for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was how people change their minds. And, you know, within this context, I do think that, okay, yeah, historically, people fell for all sorts of dumb, dangerous stuff. I do think that falling for the idea that men can literally become women or that a man literally is a woman because he announces I'm a woman is one of the most stupid stupid things that anybody could fall for. And half the time, like, I'm not really, I'm not convinced that everybody who says trans women are women actually believes that. I think a lot of times people are saying it to fit in. But then you'll see people really arguing that they are. Like, we saw this in your street epistemology videos, right? right By, right, like, girls. Right. There was a young woman who was arguing in favor of men competing in women's sport yeah we we blurred out their faces uh in one of those one of those videos i mean and and it 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 is a remarkable cultural moment isn't it it it, it is a remarkable cultural moment because there when you say a tr trans woman or women or when you institutionalize that and then you get an f on your license instead of an m because it's self-described then you know if you're arrested or you go to you get pulled over for DWI or whatever. You 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 go into a woman's cell, and th yeah. there, the the idea that so if I say well there should be women's only spaces, changing rooms, uh, domestic abuse places, rape centers, pr pr prisons, what whatever you, uh, uh, jails, someone says well th there are there are women. Okay, so so th then then we have. It, it it's not just a genuine difference of opinion. It's a safety issue. And what's even more interesting is they've changed the definition of the word woman now in Cambridge Dictionary and other dictionaries. They've included pronouns. And so so you can't adjudicate the meanings of those words through the dictionary anymore because the woke I'm trying not to say the word woke at all, but I failed. But <laughs> the woke people have now gotten out of the colleges and universities and they've taken over. They have a critical mass and they've taken over now dictionaries. And so. <laughs> I, again, it's just it's just so truly idiotic. A friend of mine uh, t texted me a picture a while ago, and I knew three of the people in the picture, and I didn't I didn't know the fourth person. And the fourth person had a, a suit jacket on, tie, full beard, pot belly, and I said, "Yeah, I I, I know those three. But who's the dude in the middle?" And he said, "LOL, that's this person. It's a it's a woman." And I was just, I was 
I mean, there's just like no, not even, not even attempting. Um, but, but but every time I say this, I every time these conversations come by, I just think it's essential to say if you want to change your sex or what have you, you're 18, 100%. You should be able to do anything you want, 100%. You know, I uh, and I've caught in massive shit for this, but I stand by it. I will call someone. I won't call someone a crazy pronoun, you know, like, but, but I'll certainly call someone if they're born a male and they want to be referred to as she, I have no problem with that. The, the, the problem I have is that when there are attendant institutional consequences to professing to change your, gen, your gender, or your sex. But, but my problem with that is not with trans people. My problem with that is that people who are pretending to be trans to access women's only spaces. Right. I mean, I would argue there's no such thing as a trans person only because I think it's an incoherent concept. Like if somebody would define clearly what it means to be a trans person, then maybe we could talk about that as some kind of group. But as of right now, if it's just you're a trans because you say you're trans, but you look exactly the same as you did yesterday, then and eh, means nothing. But I mean, I yeah, I wanted to ask you about your experiences doing these street epistemology, this you know, game that you're playing with people, the yeah. intent being to sort of not run away from difficult discussion, disagreement, controversy, but to embrace it in a productive way. I mean, have you found or learned anything about what it takes to change somebody's mind? I mean, this is a dogmatic 100%. view. It's an irrational view to say just a man is a woman, period. That's what he says. I mean, how do you get past that? Oh, a hundred percent. That's, that's great. So I just did a series, I was in Hungary and Romania for two months and I just did a series of videos and those, some of those videos are absolutely remarkable. Uh, and one of the things that you'll see, <clears throat> so those videos are coming out in a few days, but one of the things you see is, so, so I sent, I sent the questions to my team of, of you know, what I planned on asking. And one of the questions that I plan <laughs> that I ask a lot of people I asked was, would you rather be ruled by the U S or Russia? <laughs> and one of the members of my team said, what kind of question is that? Why, why are you even wouldn't like with the implication, it's a fucking idiotic question. Why are you even asking people that question? Um, but you'd be astonished how many people s stood in the neutral line because you know, I have the neutral line, slightly disagree, disagree, strongly disagree, slightly agree, agree, strongly agree. Many people just stood on the neutral line um, or, or, you know, what's the difference between the extreme right and the extreme left. But when you, when you, when you do those v view videos and I'll answer your question in a second, one of the things you realize I'm going to do those in Puerto Rico and then I'm going to go to Australia and do those. One of the oh. things that you realize in that is that, um, at least the hundreds and hundreds of Eastern Europeans I interviewed, nobody was looking for a reason to be offended. No, nobody was seeking, actively seeking out a region to be enraged at somebody else because they had held an opinion. And I've done hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people in the U S now. And that is by far the common denominator. People are not always to be sure, but the number of people who are doing that is just shocking. It's a feature of the modern age. So now I'll answer your question directly. So, and I wrote about this in my last book, how to have impossible conversations. People will change their minds, particularly about a moral issue based upon a few things. It's not based upon what you think. It's not based upon evidence. It's not even based upon reasoning. It's, it's not based upon epistemology, which is how you know what you think you know. People will change their minds about issues, particularly moral issues, for one of a few reasons. One, it's community-based. So if they feel that they're going to be shunned from their community, they're much less, less likely to change their mind. If they feel that advocating a belief, we see this with Mormons, it doesn't ma matter. I, I watched a wonderful documentary about this recently. Um, Keep Pretty, I think, what's the name of it? I, 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 I can't remember. But um, <clears throat> so, so it's the sense of community. The other thing is that people hold moral beliefs not on the basis of evidence, but on the basis of what it means to them to be a good person. And so, people will people want to be a good person. We all have the impulse toward the good, and if people believe good people believe this. I'm a good person, therefore I believe this. That's the syllogism. So there's nothing to do with evidence or reason. 
And how do you get people to change their minds? Have you had experiences in doing this this project where people have changed their minds? Oh, all the that time. All the, constantly, all the time. Oh boy, that that's more complicated. Um, so when when the the interesting thing about those videos, the Spectrum Street epistemology videos, is that when you put people on the line, you basically what you're asking them is like, say, you know, you 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 say to them. Um, you know, just because we've been talking about men, men, people born male should be able to compete in biologic women's um, sporting events. Or, or let's say it's, you know, the abortion. Well, I did one in abortion. Abortion should be allowed in the third trimester. And I even did one at Dartmouth. Abortion should be allowed up to the last day. So I'm pro-choice, but I'm against that. Just, just for, just, just for the, for the record. Um, and so, um, when, when you, when people go on a line, so you see the strength of their beliefs, cause it, it's not like binary and it's, it's not like a hundred or zero, you know, all off on all it's like people believe things to, to a degree. Like, do I believe that you're in Mexico right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, am I, am I absolutely positive that you're in Mexico? No. I mean, you could have, you, I haven't asked you, maybe you're on vacation or maybe you're just, like to tell people you're in Mexico because some jihadist is after you and you're really in Canada. I mean, I, you know, they, but so, so you know, the, all beliefs, they have some um, wiggle room in them. And so when you ask someone to stand in a line, you're asking them to concretize the strength of their belief. And so when you figure out what the reasons are that they're standing on the line and other people who are also on the line, ideally the ideally what would happen is people would be on different lines but that 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 doesn't often happen sometimes everybody stands on the same line you can still do it it's just more difficult to do okay so now let's see if i can continue there's a lot of background to this so so what do you do so you you once you figure out what someone believes you you need to figure out you need to help them figure out if the reason they have for standing on the line they're standing on is is enough for them to be on that line. And in many cases, it simply is not. And, you know, a contradiction in their thinking would reveal it. Um, I found that the most powerful question you can ever ask somebody, literally, literally the most powerful question in someone's belief life is what would it take to change your mind? I've published about that. I've written books about that. Um, and it is astonishing when you ask people that in real time and you can see them move on a line and recalibrate their beliefs in real time. All you need to do is to figure out the right targeted questions to ask. And it's actually not that difficult. That was another long answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. I mean, it's something that I'm perpetually interested in. Um, and I mean, I just, I just shared this video that you posted, I think yesterday, um, well, which thanks, I thought yeah. was great. Thanks. Yeah. And like, and it was about being honest with your friends, which is, I think something people, people are really scared to disagree in general. I think, I think they're particularly scared to disagree with their friends. Um, and in this climate, people are often afraid to tell the truth about what they really think if it's not going along with the accepted ideology within their, their friend group, their circles, um, which I think is probably, I think it's fair to say that it's usually that woke <clears throat> ideology that dominates and that people are afraid to disagree with. That was my experience in any case. I've heard this from many, many other people. Um, and I, yeah, I liked that you, you pointed out that being honest and disagreeing could actually build stronger relationships and stronger friendships. Um, because I think the fear is that they'll lose the friendship. A hundred percent for sure. Yeah. And what, what will happen is the person almost invariably the person will respect them more. And if they lost the friendship, then the reason it wasn't a genuine friendship, but I, I would call it, it wasn't a, an authentic fr friendship. That's not, that's a kind of a translation from Aristotle, but it's not the exact word, but it, it's, it's, um, it's not the, because they thought that they were friends with someone, but they actually weren't friends because the people only knew them for 
what they thought that they believed and the kind of person they thought they were, but not for who they actually were. And if someone doesn't know who you for who you actually are, you can never be friends with them. You can never have genuine friendships with them. Yeah. And I think that's important for people to know, because I mean, I think a lot of people have asked me this, probably a lot of people ask you this also, but it's like, you know, what do I do? Like my whole friend group, my family, you know, everybody at school thinks this, and I'm so scared that if they find uh, out that I think this, 100%. then I'll be punished, ostracized. And what I've started saying is I was just like, you know, because that does happen. Like I have lost a lot of friends and 100%. it can be very painful. Like it sucks, but I was like, okay, it sucks. Sometimes things suck. Sometimes life sucks a bit, but it will be okay. And you'll make new friends and they'll be better friends because they'll know you actually for you. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that gets back to the question you asked about why do people change their beliefs or at least profess to change their beliefs and they, they won't do it. It's the community aspect. It's the idea that everybody wants to belong. I mean, people want to belong more than they want to be right. And so when you have groups that accept you and you, you know, we're social, social beings, we're social creatures, that's a very, very powerful motivator, if not to believe something, then to at least profess belief in something. And now with social media, you get rewarded for professing the belief and rewarded for attacking people and reward, you know, on the, your ID, your perceived ideological enemies, but it, it, it leads you down to despair. I mean, that's the ultimate path for that. It's just, it, it will always end in despair because you, mm -hmm. because you'll, you'll actually be more lonely because you've lived a lie and, and your friendships are based upon false things. I'm going to let you go soon because it's been about an hour. I really appreciate this conversation. Um, I suppose to end, I might ask you what you would tell someone, how would they go about that? You know, they're, let's assume they're a young person, they're in university, they're living in an urban center where progressive politics are the norm and they don't want to be isolated and ostracized or worse, you know, bullied or threatened. You know, how do they go about having these disagreements or simply just being honest about things that they think or are thinking about? Yeah, the, 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 the first step is, is it important to be honest? Yes. Is it important to be courageous? Yes. But what's far more important than that, at least initially, is to listen to people and to really try to figure out what it is that someone professes to believe. And and right now we don't have much listening going on. We have a lot of nastiness, a lot of name calling, a lot of invective, a lot of people freaking out about whatever they're freaking out about, but there's not a lot of listening. And so the first job in any conversation is to truly understand what it is that, that someone believes and why they believe it. And, once you've figured that out, you don't even have to say what you believe. I think that's that's a mistake to, to think, oh, you know, just because you want to lead an authentic life, that doesn't mean that you walk around telling everybody every single thought that's in your head. You know, like if, if you want to lead an authentic life and you're like you're walking down the street with your boyfriend and there's a cute guy and you think, oh, man, I'd love to sleep <laughs> with that guy. Oh, he'd be great in bed. Oh, I bet you'd be just, you know, just being honest. Yeah. So, so that, that, so that, that's not what, and uh, I, I just assumed you're straight. I have no, no idea what, what, what floats your boat. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so that s s dumping content, dumping everything in your mind with somebody that does not make you authentic. That, that makes you, <laughs> that makes you a fool. Uh, so, so you have to have some kind of, you have to have some kind of a, f a, a filter. So, so to, to take a step back, I'll construct a little edifice here. So the first step is listening and then repeating back. The next step is like really within the context of listening, it's like really repeating back to make sure that you actually understand what someone believes, asking them why they believe it is good. That's not necessary. And I would always ask like, Oh, like, Oh, um, well, let's say, so let's say that you're the person who believes this. So you could say, Oh, like, well, what if someone said this, my daughter's a friend, um, read my book and she asked me what to do because she feels that way in her class when when the teacher she goes to public school here in Portland and she said basically the the teacher pushes an agenda and she she wants to question it or or but she's afraid because someone else has asked questions and the teacher's gone you know 
if, uh, allegedly gotten upset and given the student poor grades, et cetera. And I said, oh, well, you know, one of the things you can do is just say, oh, I'm, I'm curious, what do we do if someone says this? What, what, do, what do we do or how would, how would that argument, I'm not saying I'm making that argument, but how, how would one respond to that argument or how would you respond to that argument? Um, okay, so that's that's kind of a, a framework, a totally grossly oversimplified framework, but a framework. And then at some level, once you figure out what someone actually believes, um, many things could be happening. It, it could be that everybody, like you said, is just pretending to believe something. Dan Dennett writes about that, the philosopher Dan Dennett and breaking the spell. Stephen Pinker also writes about that. But it could be that there are entire communities of people who are just pretending to believe something. Uh, that's the problem now with cancel culture, et cetera. You can't say certain things. You can't make certain jokes. If you're a comedian, you can't advocate. Look what they're trying to do to Peterson right now, fellow Canadian, uh, you know, um, revoke his license because he needs social media training. But <laughs> what, what petty tyrants. Um, okay. <clears throat> but okay. So, the, so then the, the next level of that is t telling people what you actually believe. But I would suggest not telling people what you actually believe until you actually understand what they believe. Mm. Um, so, <clears throat> cause it could be that you're, you're closer than, than you think. And, and a lot of that listening, it's just really listening and repeating back to people. That's a great rapport builder. And, and just saying, um, you can use this thing called minimal encouragers where you take the last two or three things that people says, like the last words and just repeat those back to them and just keep people talking to, so that you can just grok not just understand like a truly get what people are talking about <clears throat> so at some point when you want to make your your view known uh th those can either lead to really interesting productive conversations again if you recenter listening on that or they can lead to the end of friendships but if they're and, I, and i've lost i've now lost four of my uh, people who are close friends of mine like really like you know call each other up um you know, I'll tell you who these people are, but you know, you know, some, you know, some, so I won't tell you who they are, but uh, people who have been in my home, you know, people who have, and I've been very blunt with them. I, I've told them that I think that they're in the orbit of a dangerous ideology. And I told them that, that I, this is after the listening, after the espousing positions, et cetera. Um, it's heartbreaking, but what kind of life do you want to lead? What kind of friendships do you want to have? If if you cannot have a friendship in which, and I was completely willing to be their friends, they were the ones who befriended me because mm. they, of course, they all befriended me for the same reason. They became woke. They became uh, hyper aware, or it wouldn't even you say that as a judgment. They became so aware of the injustices around them and as their being white, heterosexual, I'll even throw in cis men, that they view themselves as complicit in a larger social problem in which the power structure was made up by people like them. And they were upset with me for thinking that I wasn't um, yielding sufficient ground to people to give them equal opportunities in life. That's mm -hmm. a, a very charitable interpretation of, <laughs> of their... <laughs> of, <laughs> of their criticism yes. uh, but in those in, in those cases why would you want to have a why would you want to be in a relationship with somebody who doesn't know you for who you are yeah that's what that's another thing that i i've said that i've learned recently too is that <clears throat> instead i'm like well, yeah why why would you want to be friends with somebody who doesn't accept you as you are Correct. or who would abandon you so readily because you say something that they disagree with or you feel a different way than they like, I don't want to be around that, those kind of people. And I don't want to live in fear. You know, I want to be myself in my life and out in the world, of course. And that that's also, I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty important. People know by and large, this is a very new phenomenon. I mean, when I, I, I just from my own personal experience, thinking back when I was a kid, my parents uh, were Massachusetts liberals. My, my, um, that they had people but we used to get together on a Saturday night and you know I wouldn't hang out with my parents friends but you know I'd be around and they'd be arguing about the death penalty a lot of death penalty or what, whatever it was at that time and then they get together next weekend again but now it's as if if someone believes virtually everything that you believe in but you just have a few points of disagreement oh I can't be friends with that person but but I but you know for sure there are deal breakers Hitchens talks about this too you know that 
that you know th there's a difference if someone tells you that you know they they cheated on their taxes and if they tell you they just you know molested somebody Mm -hmm. And so, so for sure there are deal breakers, but the threshold for what's a deal breaker is so low right now that anybody who doesn't have beliefs that are completely congruent with your own is automatically the enemy, right? There's some kind of moral monster. No, they're not a moral monster. They just happen to have a disagreement. It could be that you're the one who's wrong. Yeah. And I mean, that's sort of, it's been something that I've been trying to explain to other feminists in terms of the pro-life, pro-choice debate, because of course, a lot if not all feminists seem to believe that anybody who's pro-life is bad and evil. Um, and, you know, pro-life people tend to think that pro-choice people are bad and evil. But I know women who I consider my friends who I've done panels with before who, like, I like as people who are adamantly pro-life and I'm adamantly pro-choice. And, you know, we've talked about it a little bit. It's not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to, they're not trying to change my mind. I'm not trying to change their mind. But I know that they're not bad people. They know that I'm not a bad person. And yet, if you try to explain this to other feminists, especially, I mean, online conversations are, are usually pretty crappy and limited. But, you know, they'll, uh, they, they won't get it or they'll, pretend right. not to get it like well but they are bad because they're taking away women's rights and how could you work with somebody who's like that like there's a very clear line for them and it does seem to be a black and white issue and i just i'm like why don't you go talk to a pro-life person in real life not on the internet yeah like in real life face to face have a conversation and see if you actually really hate that person in real life yeah don't you think that's a silly thing to lose a friendship over yes like, I mean, why? I mean, it, it just, I mean, don't even to the fact, don't you think that that would even make your friendship stronger if, if you, and then not only that, don't you think it would even sharpen you intellectually to engage those ideas with people who, with whom you have disagreements? Totally. I mean, well, I thought maybe I, I was like, maybe I am wrong. I don't know. I haven't engaged this argument possible. before. So I want to listen. I want to hear what you have to say. I've listened. I've tried to, I've learned. I've heard what they had to say. At the end of the day, I still, and pro-choice. Right. And so so <laughs> that was one of the main things in my last book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, Let Friends Be Wrong. Just let friends be wrong. It's, you, you know, it's okay if someone has a disagreement with you. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that that there are there are non-negotiables. So yeah. you just have to figure out what, what those are. But I think I think we live in a time right now that's just horrifically polarized, made worse by social media. People aren't talking to each other. And not only are they not talking to each other, they've they've lost the they don't even they don't even want to quote unquote platform or listen because you're platforming Nazis. Or I'm why would I listen to a Nazi? Or why would I I mean again, again, it's just somebody it who's is, anti science. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's a, selling it's, it's, disinformation. It's a derangement syndrome. Yeah, and it's made worse. I saw a little <laughs> clip that my buddy, uh, I mentioned before in this episode, Schellenberger put out of when uh, Trump was on 60 Minutes. And I, to, to make no doubt about it, I think Trump was a lunatic, but I don't have t Trump derangement syndrome either. But, you know, they, they claim that, um, that, that Trump, um, the, you know, Trump was pushing back about the, high, the, the Hunter Biden laptop story. And for complete and full disclosure, like just in the, in, the, in, the, in the spirit of practicing what I preach, I was wrong about that. I made a mistake. I thought it was Russian disinformation. I believe the experts. I was wrong. So if that's my full disclosure to you. Um, but yeah, they, they, they savaged him on that. Okay, whatever, a cultural moment. But was there, a, was there a retraction later? Did they issue a formal apology to him? Did they say, no, I mean, of course not. They can't, they, but that's what integrity looks like. Integrity looks like when you made a mistake. I just saw somebody online that I, I thumbed up. Who was it? I um, uh, can't remember. He, he apologized on Twitter because he excoriated somebody for making fun of Lex Friedman's reading list. I can't believe how much, how, how many people were obsessed with Lex Friedman's reading list. I, I can't even believe anybody cared about Lex Friedman's reading list, but, but I, I think it's really important to, especially when you move in the public space, if you've made a mistake or if you were wrong about something to openly admit that you're wrong, because that's a modeling behavior that other people can see like, Oh, Hey, this guy said he was wrong about this. Oh, Bogosian, not that I'm some kind of model to emulate, but, you know, Bogosian was wrong about uh, tons of shit, but like the Hunter Biden laptop story, I'm not afraid to say it. I made a mistake. I own my mistakes. I, 
did the best that I could. Uh, and then if anybody responds to that, oh, you fucking moron, you idiot, what a fool, you dupe, you stooge, you left wing, you know, fool or whatever it is. If anybody responds to that, those people are toxic and they ultimately they, it's it's probably best to not have them in your life. Mm, yeah, because yeah. we want we want to create exactly the opposite culture when someone says they made a mistake about something. Say, hey, you know, hey, thanks for saying that. Appreciate it that. should be a show of strength, not a show of weakness. It is 100%. a show of strength. And it, it, as you say, like it's really about integrity and integrity is something that is so, so important to me. Yeah. And the other thing that falls into that category, and I'll just, I'll let you go on this is um, the same can be said when someone says, I don't know. Right. It, it's really important that we start rewarding people who say, I don't know when they actually don't know, because when you, when you do that, then you create a culture where people don't feel morally and socially compelled to pretend to know things they don't know. Yeah, definitely. I, this was a, such a great conversation. I'm oh, so cool. glad that we got to ch to, to talk. I really yeah, appreciate thanks. your time. Thanks. I've been, a, I've been a huge admirer. Uh, oh, so, thank you. So, that's so, very kind of you to say. I'm, I've also good. been a huge admirer. Oh, yeah, we should have an <laughs> admirer party. <laughs> <laughs> I hope someday we do. Um, when do you head to Puerto Rico? Uh, I head to Puerto Rico this month, and then awesome. I, I uh, in March, I have a visiting professorship. I'm going to do some videos uh, in, I think, March, and then April. I'm um, Oh, and then Flor Flor I'll be in Florida in uh, February, and then I'm, I'm heading to Estonia um, wow. in, a after that sometime. So I'm, I'm, I'm busy. <laughs> But That's awesome. Good. Well, I can't wait to see what you produce and do let me know if you ever head to Mexico, eh? Oh, I, 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 I heard the A there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. I will do. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Take All care. Right. Thanks. Bye-bye.